Thank you, Johanna, for your generous introduction. And good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. I feel very honored to be the last speaker for this semester's Kappa series, Ending Worlds. So the title of my talk is Voices Mediated, Plants and Landscapes as Apocalyptic Responses to the Ming-Ching Cataclysm. I will share with you some of the research results of my current research fellowship for the Epochal Life Worlds project at Heidelberg. Part of today's contents belong to my dissertation. In this lecture, I explore the main question, how did the 17th century Chinese artists react to the virus physical and the mental catastrophe they experienced during the Ming-Qing transition? The 17th century Ming-Qing transition witnessed severe climate changes in the so-called Little Ice Age, successive great famines, natural disasters, and dynastic shift and lasting wars with social disorder. To survive in the severe natural and social disturbance, moving and hiding became two major interwoven themes in this period. I especially focus on the visual representations of plants and landscapes in 17th century Chinese paintings and the human nature interactions mirrored in these representations. Through the examination of the representations, I suggest in the times of social disorder and natural calamity, when the communication through actual words between people became more difficult to come out than usual for many reasons during and after the crisis, the 17th century Chinese artists tended to depict plants and landscapes to represent their feelings of pain, the action of resistance, the hope for future, and their own self-representation of moral integrity. Before we see the artist's paintings, I would like to introduce a bit about the, um, the context, what types of cataclysms took place in the 17th century Ming-Qing transition, what was the impact on individuals' life. Then I will lead you through four case studies uh, of five artists' paintings and also their poems, including both male and female painters. So uh, we will have a good gender balance today. For a long time, scholars have mainly considered the political corruption and weakness of the Ming Dynasty government that um, led to its collapse. In the recent decade, scholars of the Ming-Qing environmental history have started to call attention to the drastic changes in natural environments and the following empire-wide disasters and social disorders, for example, the Great Famines, epidemic diseases, and also the interrelated um, peasant rebellions. They tend to think of nature and the tension between the natural environments and human society as critical factors that accelerated the decline of the Ming Dynasty and the rise of the Qing governance, which is beyond the consideration of the social and human factors only. Environmental historians have indicated that even before the uh, 1644 turning point, China experienced severe climate changes and the de uh, deterioration in the Little Ice Age, which led to the Great Famine's social unrest and also the Ming government's vulnerability to the nomadic invasions from the north. And there were different kinds of natural disasters coming one after another, such as droughts, locust disasters, and floods. For example, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I should have should I put this slide before. So actually we see the, um, the different disasters and crises, um, um, both natural and social, they are kind of interrelated and um, um, there are some, some um, factors that link them. So one lead to another and there is this circle and it's never stop. And I want to, uh, for example, I want to bring this diagram, which shows the distribution of the number of counties in late Ming China, uh, influenced by three disasters in the years between 1610 and 1644, which is just before the dynastic shift uh, in, in 1644. 
There are two peak seasons. First, from 1615 to 1617. Second, uh, from 1638 to 1641. Of course, the second was the most disastrous. And then we will see um, a slight decrease before 1644. However, when we, see this um, uh, when we see this diagram, which shows the distribution of three disasters during the severe second peak between 1638 and 1641, especially in 1640 and 1641, which is here, um, the two below, the southwest of China began to suffer more especially from floods and severe droughts. The southwest area, often called the Jiangnan region, is the area where the artists um, I discussed lived. I believe that their paintings from both the changing natural and social environments had an impact on their arts, and their arts could have transmitted their traumatic feelings and their hope for the future, even if the hope was small and slow. Now please follow me to see the paintings by the first artist in and out of a dangerous position, the female artist and poet Huang Yuanjie. This figure has been studied by Dorothy Core initially, and later um, more and more paintings by her actually came up in, in the last decade, and just recently her poetry anthology has been reproduced and published, so it, it's available to scholars for study. Huang Yuanjie, also named Jie Ling, she was born into a poor branch of a loose, lustrous gentry family in Jiaxing of Zhejiang. Unfortunately, she married a failed scholar, poor scholar, Yang Shigong. So she, um, and basically she as a, a, a talented woman uh, in poetry and arts, um, had to take, take the responsibility of feeding her family. And her social mobility provided the convenience to gain fame and selling, uh, sell his, her painting and poetry for a living. Um, but it, it also made her original elite identity questionable in the Confucian society. Her experience of being captured by the Manchu rebel troops in Jiaxing in the year Yiyou, 1645, brought her trauma. She was likely raped while being captured and which she implied in the long autobiographical poem, Sound of Solitary Reclusion, Li, Li Ge, and she actually presented this poem to her brother. The problem was not only her suffering from the abduction itself, but also the critique of her moral integrity from her contemporaries. For example, the renowned scholar Zhu, Yizu, Zhu Yizun said, Huang is suspected to stay close to the color of dust raised by the wind. The dust raised by the wind refers to the term wind and dust, feng chen, or women from the wind and dust, feng chen nu zi, a euphemism for sex workers from pleasure quarters. In this way, Huang was compared to prostitute or courtesan. When facing such trauma, personal crisis, and strict social judgment, Huang developed her reclusive character and orchestrated her conceptual and actual withdrawal while remaining a social woman. I'm not going to explain much about her, um, how she associated her um, self-identity with the persona of a, a recluse. Some scholars have discussed this part. I want to draw attention to her landscape paintings and discuss how these images might have re reflected her mind and feelings about the catastrophe. This is a fan painting made by Huang Yuanjie. This painting has an unusual composition. It is arranged in, one, in a one corner composition. In the lower middle section and the right lower corner, it features a small empty hut under a, a huge rock or boulder, which in, uh, is in an odd shape, like a spiral shell. Besides them, there are two tall trees. They are situated on the edge of a cliff to its right. It indicates its location of difficult access, which I suggest that it implies Huang's difficult state of mind. It also reflects Huang's innermost struggles for living in poverty 
and the critique of her contemporaries, um, her tough situation as a gentry-born woman, woman who was tortured, exiled, and perhaps lost her chastity during the Manchu invasion. The humble hut by the cliff is empty and quiet. I compare it to uh, with Nizan's painting, which also uh, features an empty pavilion, um, actually in the middle, kind of middle and front part of the painting. Um, it is uh, positioned in the pleasant landscape with lands, river, and remote hills. The hut is unusually, uh, I mean, in Huang's painting, is unusually um, um, situated and almost squeezes under a large, odd-shaped odd -shaped rock, and is sheltered by two tall trees. It is conspicuous that these elements are placed on the cliff or edge of a mountain, actually without other background. So it, we don't know where it is. And it's kind of suggesting its solitary and difficult condition. Huang wrote two lines in the middle above. We can check the poems. The broken eaves just make the sunshine visible. The tall trees do not obstruct the view of clouds. I think the words match the visual representation very well. We cannot see the exact broken eaves on the little hut, but we can imagine the damage of such a small hut under the huge boulder on the edge of a mountain. However, the perception was positive. Although the eaves were broken, we could see the sunshine coming, which is indicated in the poem. And a similar message is obvious in the second line. There are two big trees covering the little hut, but they do not obstruct the view of clouds in the sky. The description of the environment expresses her optimistic view of the disadvantaged situation. Huang also depicted an empty hut in a dangerous position in other paintings. For example, on the uh, left side, this Hanyi scroll painting um, date is dated 1646, so after the turning point 1644. She borrows the iconography of the empty hut from the Yuan painter Ni Zan on the right, and Ni Zan de delineated, delineates um, three distance levels in his landscape painting. So we actually see much space from the front to the back. However, the empty pavilion in Huang's painting is situated below the mountain with, with big boulders on the top. There is not much distance space between the pavilion and the mountain. The composition gives a feeling of instability. It feels as if the boulders are going to fall down and destroy the empty hut. I think the portrait of a dangerous position is coherent with that um, in her uh, fan painting that we have seen before. Um, I also want to connect this position, the dangerous position, with her real life, which was recorded in her friend's writings. There are several of them delivering the sa same information, so we could s consider them reliable. For example, written by the poet Cheng Wei Song, uh, a friend of her. So he said, I once saw she lived in a small chamber near one side of the Xiling Bridge, uh, which is on West Lake Hangzhou. She was selling her paintings, uh, poetry to make a living on her own. Once her living was slightly maintained, she refused to write or paint for economic purposes. And the second, Fang um, Zhou, Zhou Yi, the publisher of her poetry. So he wrote, in the summer of this year, I traveled on the lake, Huang Jieling dwelt next to pleasure quarters. So Huang, in her later life, lived in a small chamber next to pleasure quarters near the Xiling Bridge over the West Lake in Hangzhou, um, a, metro, a metropolis city um, in China, for the convenience of, of selling paintings and poetry to make a living. Yet, in the narratives by her friends, such as Qian Qing Yi, he said that she, li she lived in great poverty because she did not sell too much, trying to maintain her moral integrity. Um, Huang might not have been so poor in reality, because I think 
because she, she constantly sell her painting, but her gesture of not selling too much seems to have rescued her virtue to some extent. And so she became more and more renowned in her later life. I find the descriptions of her life and the visual language in her painting interactive. And I think the composition of having an empty heart in a dangerous position was a metaphor for Huang's own situation and state of mind. Huang also painted more peaceful landscapes, like this one. It is a tranquil spring landscape that she painted in the early spring of 1641, several years after the, her abduction by the Manchu troops. The landscape style of Huang's spring landscape bears visual reference to both the Yuan master painters Ni Zan and Huang Gongwang. In a, similar, uh, in a simple and clear manner with dry ink, minimum ink wash, light hues of blue and brown, Huang depicts a small landscape without any human presence. It encompasses an aisle with a stand of trees in the forefront at the lower right corner. To its diagonal left, the remote mountains with several empty huts. Noticeably, um, in the front water bank of shaw or shawls, there is a single willow tree. Can you see it? Um, in a leaning pose, contrasting to the straight trees on the upper aisle, the branches of the leaning willow, willow droop with leaves visible near the water surface. It is placed in the central position of the composition and the background of the blank space um, makes it a focal point of the painting. Hui Shu Li argues that this solitary willow was a self-representation of Huang, and I agree to this point. Considering that this painting was a gift to her close friend Liu, Liu Shi, who was a renowned courtesan concubine, and this painting was made to pair her Liu's um, willow painting made in 1641 before the dynastic shift, I find it very interesting to investigate the communication between the two women through the voices of two willow paintings mounted on the same scroll. It has been well argued that Liu Rushi closely related her self-identity to the imagery of willows through her adopted names and poetry. In Liu's painting, this courtesan artist basically said, I'm so happy that I got married, and I'm now living with my husband, an eminent scholar official, in our uh, garden villa. Look, in our gardens, there are numerous willows blown by the wind of spring, along with the peach blossoms. She made a statement about her life transformation from a low-born courtesan by using the Im imagery of wind-blown spring, uh, spring willows. So, to, to pair the willow painted by Huang in 1651 as a response to Liu's willows in 1643, this willow is solitary, quiet, and lonely. Does it represent the, the loneliness of Huang living in a small chamber selling her paintings next to pleasure quarters by the West Lake? I leave this question open. So far, since we, uh, I have talked about the specific plants, I want to discuss a bit about the social hierarchy and gender of plants in Chinese culture. So basically, there are some generally virtuous plants. For example, four gentlemen, plum, orchid, bamboo, chrysanthemum, and three friends of winter, which are pine, bamboo, and, uh, and plum. They are generally, we consider it virtuous, and they were used until now. They have certain botanic qualities that are interlinked with the moral characteristics of Confucian scholars in the human world. The pine and the bamboo are both evergreen and strong. The pine could live for centuries and stand for longevity, while the bamboo has flexibility that it can bend and sustain in strong winds. The plum is one of the um, first trees to blossom in the cold early spring. However, there are also corrupted plants, but they, we should understand them in specific context. For example, yanghua, the willow catkins, 
They were often um, associated with unfaithful women. And, uh, um, sorry, I forgot to explain, because the, the willow catkins kind of, um, uh, they, they, um, they fly everywhere, and uh, um, they belong to the willows that um, grow by the water. So the, the mobility is somehow uh, um, is a metaphor of women's um, high social mobility and, uh, um, and their engagement with um, the external world. And plant, plants are, also, um, are often gendered also. They often embody both female and male identities. So we cannot say, okay, they pl this plant is female, that plant is male. In my research, I often see this composite I gender in one plant. For example, the willow can represent a courtesan, a prostitute, because of uh, it, the soft kind of slender willows represent the, uh, the feminine bodies of women. But there's also cultural reference that can associate willow to an ancient hermit. So we have these two genders in one plant. Okay, now uh, we are going back to the next artist who also painted willows. I am an abandoned willow awaiting spring, the loyalist artist and poet Gong Xian. Gong Xian was a leading artist of the so-called eight masters of Nanjing. During the Qing transition, he was a professional painter and a also teacher um, of paintings, who sold his painting uh, for a living. In the late Ming, um, he was not a scholar official, but he has a close interaction with members of, of the Fuxia society based in Nanjing, and this society was intended for political pursuits. The decline of the Ming dynasty and the Manchu conquest of China actually shifted his life. Like many others, Gong Xian was a Ming loyalist a Yiming, leftover person who was against the Qing Manchu rule of China. In 1645, when Gong Xian moved from Nanjing to Yangzhou, he witnessed the Manchu army's 10-day massacre in the city of Yangzhou, although he luckily escaped from being killed as he lived in the northern suburb. Unlike those who committed suicide or became martyrs in the anti-Qing protests, Gong Xian secluded himself and lived in exile, reclusion, during the chaotic times of dynastic transition. As a poet and a painter facing the social crisis and subsequent personal crisis, through the, his brush for writing and painting, his political expression, resistance, voices were bold and explicit, and his emotions were strong and intense. This artist, refused to depict willows as soft, slender, and loose, um, luxurious, which are associated with beautiful women, courtesans, and sorrow. Instead, he created the iconography of abandoned willows that are withered, dead willows growing in the winter, cold, dark. The art, art historian, Jeremiah, Silvergelt in 1980 has significantly argued that willows in Gong Xian's paintings were his self-portraits. Yet it seems that after uh, uh, Silvergelt's earlier article, there is hardly any further discussion on Gong Xian's willow images. Actually, the whole subgenre of willow paintings has not received sufficient scholarly attention in Chinese art history compared with other subgenres of plants mostly virtuous plants, such as the orchid and plum. My study on Gong Xian's iconography of abandoned willows follows Silbergeld's argument, and I want to decode his voices in the representation of his abandoned willows, and also discuss the relations among different species of plants and different types and, or situations of willows within nature in his art world. Gong did have a clear hierarchy of trees, which he did, did indicated clearly in his painting manual for teaching. In Gong's theory, among all the trees, only the pine trees, cypress, wutong, seda, willows, and the maple trees, they are important, they are significant. The other trees are insignificant. 
and he distinguished his abundant willows in cold winter from the soft spring willows. Here he wrote, the abundant willows and cold win willows are ranked at the top. If you paint the leaves, it will become the beautiful woman painting. Like the objects, so like the willows, growing next to the Taihu rocks. Visually, Gong's iconic abandoned willows mostly have no leaves. The willow branches are not soft, they are not weeping down, but going up with much strength. And very often, they are mannered in dark and pa or pale monochrome ink without bright colors. So the two women artists' willows we just see and the, this and the willow kind of exemplified um, in the, this Ming painting, they will not be his choices because that's his favorite. And in landscapes, always no human figures, but some with empty houses, suggesting the sense of human life. The name abundant willow comes from the term Huang Liu, which he wrote uh, the uh, which he wrote in the inscriptions in parallel to his willow images that are represented as uh, withered or dead without any leaves. He painted his abandoned willows in many of his paintings. For example, this one. So on the back we see this um, river suggested by the uh, blank space. And this is uh, um, part of a, a, a long uh, hand scroll painting, and we see willows here. There is a contrast of um, the, um, the dark ink and the uh, kind of white background. He also depicted a, a, an empty hut in the high position here, surrounded by many abandoned willows in pale ink, as the companion of the lonely pavilion higher. I particularly want to call attention to one painting. It portrays one landscape in pale monochrome ink with many withered, abandoned willows on the rocks and a few empty houses on the back. And uh, um, you probably don't know the meaning, I mean, and then I go to check his inscription. I think you have already seen that there are a lot of texts, inscriptions on the painting. That's because in pre-modern Chinese paintings, there is this very strong, long-lasting inscription culture. So when the artists write, especially the, um, those, um, they, they are literary, so they would write poems, write their thoughts about the paintings, um, just on, um, on the painting. So you can immediately see how the text and image, they interact with each other. So let's look at the, the poem to see how, why, how, why he, he painted this thing. He says, every family opens a door to face the sun. Where is the sun? Surrounded by rocks and with wine cup set forth. Why do we need to escape the Qing dynasty and enter the hidden cave? Wherever peach blossoms bloom is the immortal's land with the signature, the leftover in wilderness. Uh, that's his artist seal. What does it mean? It's actually very strange because we don't see any peach blossom springs. And uh, um, actually, this, this uh, poem refers to the peach blossom spring written by the uh, Eastern Jin recluse poet Tao Yuanming. So in, um, in, in that reference, so Tao Yuanming depicts a kind of um, immortal land, idealized land that a fisherman um, entered into a cave um, just by mistake. And then he found, oh, these people, they were actually coming from the Qing dynasty and they didn't know what's happening outside. And, and he didn't want to get out, but then he, he left. But he never found the way to enter this cave again. So that's really the peach blossom spring, or it's called Pe peach blossom land. That's the ideal land, it's a beautiful land. But here we don't see any, we only see abandoned um, willows. 
in that reference, the, the peach blossoms are, are the most important plants. We don't see it. So I think the, the contrast between the visual elements and that the poem, it's very obvious and triggering. And it says, wherever peach blossom bloom is the immortal's land. I also want to compare this painting with another painting actually in the same period, which is just about the peach blossom spring. So you see, we see the cave and the peach blossoms in pink colors. It's a very colorful painting. And uh, we also can find the, there's a little guy. Um, it doesn't look like a fisherman, but probably a scholar. So this is the, the same period artist, also Nanjing artist, a friend of him, his depiction of the peach blossom spring. So we compare the two different paintings. The, the colorful one was painted in 1646. So it's kind of um, a bit several years after the Manchu conquest of the Ming in 1644. But that one, Gongxian's painting, it was painted in 1688. Um, and in, in that, can, until 1680s, um, uh, uh, the anti-Qing military resistance were mostly destroyed. So he kind of, the, he lost the hope to have the revival of the Ming Dynasty. So in that situation, he painted this peach blossom land without peach blossoms, but abandoned willows. But he somehow suggests the hope was in his mind, in his vision, which cannot come out anymore. And, um, and I also want to um, link his painting to his writing and I, I put the two lines here. So let's look at the upper part. So Gongxian basically wrote his theories about painting willows in, in his um, writings. And first line, the willow is the most difficult to paint among the subject matter of trees. So willow is important. And only the abandoned willows and withered willows can be painted. The slender, soft, bewitching ones growing beside the Thai rocks should be avoided the most. And I think the second line is most important. What is meant by abandoned willows and withered willows? They are the most bewitching. So it's kind of contradict contradictory. On the one side, they said, okay, we, 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 we don't need the bewitching willows. And on the other hand, he said that the abandoned willows and the withered willows, they are the most bewitching, because being void of spring actually means embodying the infinite spirit of spring. And I think this is somehow speak to the um, Gong's painting, actually the, the uh, peach blossom spring with abandoned willows, which does not paint the spring, but shows the spirit of the spring. And I also want to relate to um, actually one clue because um, in 1640, 1640, before the dynastic shift, uh, Gongxian, uh, Gongxian had this interest in Buddhism, so he became a lay Buddhist disciple of the Chan Buddhist master, Jue uh, Lang Daosheng. And I, and I recently read uh, Corey Bell's uh, dissertation on this Chan master's um, theory on poetry. And Corey Bell, he argued that um, Dao Shen, the Chan master, advocated that poetry in voicing indignation about injustice sincerely can relieve anger and promote moral um, rectitude in dark times. And to make this argument, Dao Shen borrowed the theories from the Book of Changes and the idea of yin yang. And he contended that the winter, the near complete dominance of yin, dark cold power represented by the direct indignation could promote the return of spring, could trigger the re-emergence of yang, the bright and warm. I think they're actually in scholarship, they're, we only know that Gongxian was a disciple of this Chan master. There is no further um, study on their relationship and how Gongxian learned from this master. But I just find, um, this idea of 
how to transform from winter to spring, somehow perhaps Gongxian learned from his teacher and presented in his painting of abandoned willows. That's the, that's the abandoned willow painting showing hope because it's waiting for the spring. There is this transformative power force that could happen and given hope. Okay, so I think I finished Gongxian. And now we um, jump to the, another artist, actually two artists. So the title is A Rootless Orchid as Activist, Female Voices. Courtesan concubine artists and poets, Gu Mei and Liu Ruxi. Um, because I just finished a, a talk about the, uh, the, their art, so I still, my memory is still fresh. Okay, how do we start? That's the painting. So that's a collaborative work by two courtesans. In the moment when they both married, we know the scholar officials and became the con courtesan concubines. So courtesans in the Ming Dynasty, so basically, um, mostly in, in, in uh, Imperial China, they were low born in status, but they have ambiguous um, kind of status also because they were um, accomplished in arts and literature. So they, they were also elite somehow, but their social status was kind of controversial and uh, debatable was kind of low. So they really want to transcend this, their social status from the um, kind of debased to the gentry. And they all kind of wanted to marry renowned scholar officials. So they made it at this point, because the painting, uh, it was dated uh, 1646, they all married. But then the dynastic shift came, 1644, remember, their husband, served the Qing. They became the turncoat officials. So somehow, the, the courtesans, they tried to achieve the kind of um, moral integrity, kind of by marrying a um, kind of moral, uh, righteous gentlemen. But then, how about their husbands? When their husbands kind of lost their moral integrity, how did they deal with that? So that's the voice of their orchid, actually rootless orchid imagery. Um, it's a long story, but basically um, this rootless orchid imagery, we see its roots, it's kind of opposing. We don't see any earth, any, any land. So that's a representation of the homeless state of a person, of the human beings. And we can refer it to the Yuan Dynasty uh, painter, um, a loyalist painter, Zheng Sixiao. Um, I didn't put this painting because we don't have so many time to go through that. But I want to say that um, Zheng, si, Zheng Sixiao's orchid, that imagery, was developed in the, um, actually in the uh, Yuan Ming transition to be a very um, activist, radical imagery to show the loyalism, to show the resistance. And here in the late Ming, this iconography was already very much accepted. So we would say that this, um, uh, the courtesan's um, orchid, it really refers to that convention. And this painting was painted by Gu Mei. And then her courtesan friend, Liu Ruxi, wrote 10 poems on this album. So that's a collaborative kind of artwork. And here I just want to show um, one, um, actually almost exactly the same composition. There's slightly difference. Uh, so this orchid uh, of Zheng Sixiao was uh, published in the painting manual book and uh, it was um, circulated widely. So we see this is a clear reference to Zheng Sixiao's rootless orchid, without land, without earth, to show this homeless state because the person has lost um, the country, lost their home. And what I want to say is that basically the courtesans um, in, we scholars have argued that um, in the 17th century, courtesans painted orchids, but they were mostly not so political. Courtesans painted orchids in literary gatherings and show this painting to their male clients. 
So that's kind of a very essential performance. Orchids also, um, why courtesans painted orchids? Oh, because orchids, they were symbols of righteous gentlemen that we can trace it back to Yuan's poetry in Warring States periods in early China. So by painting orchids, the, the courtesans actually say, okay, um, I'm loyal to you. I'm like a righteous gentleman. I'm loyal to the, um, the, um, the lover, the male lover. And on the other hand, okay, it's kind of showing the connection between the, um, the kind of kind of also very slender and feminine um, depiction of orchid um, and their female body. So there are the two kind of meanings hidden there. But here, I think this is the first painting I saw that courtesans really use the, um, the orchid imagery to show their political expression. And I think it really speaks to their, um, their marriage relationship because their husbands, they were not loyal. And uh, by using this imagery, the courtesans um, either kind of rescued their uh, female virtue by saying, okay, I am uh, loyal to the country. So I think that's the, um, the message here. So we go into details of the painting, um, the poetry, because the poetry is tell the meaning. So Liu Rushi, um, she wrote, who can appreciate your exquisite sentiment? It is desperate to find no ground for the roots to grow and depend on. So we, saw, we see clearly that's a reference to the, the rootless orchid of Zheng Sixiao, which is loyalist political. And reluctant to grow together with the green Ganadharma on the rock, how can it bear with the thorns and mosses? Wash the roots and shots clean and get rid of any dirt getting well prepared for the rings blown by the easterly uh, winds. There is one literature scholar who studied this poetry and the last line, getting well prepared for the rings blown by the easterly wind. So he indicated, which I totally agree, the easterly winds refers to the anti-Qing force because the next year, so after the painting was made, this courtesan also physically, actually supported the anti-Qing force. So in Fujian, um, and he, that was a failure, but somehow he really participated in the anti-Qing uh, movements herself um, while um, her husband was already serving the Qing dynasty. So we see this kind of conflicts in the marriage relationship. Okay. And I also uh, want to talk about a little about the Buddhist connotations in this painting because that's what the poem um, writes about. Um, so besides the anti-Qing enthusiasm, the noticeable Buddhist diction in Liu's poems on the painting reflects the shared interest in the Buddhist thought among the courtesan concubine friends, uh, which could be understood within the uh, late Ming popularity of uh, Buddhist reading and practice in women's circles. Both courtesans had Buddhist names. For example, Gu Mei uh, called herself Shan Shi and Zhi Zhu and Liu called herself Wo Wen Ju Shi. And we, if we check the poems, for example, the first line, the world beings mostly depend on the material form. Um, the, the kind of last term, um, si, si xiang, from um, the, um, the, the, the poem, um, uh, is a Buddhist word for um, material appearance and external manifestation. And uh, uh, if we see the second line, the top of the brush broke the realm of empty space. So the, the realm of empty space, xu kong jie, is also a Buddhist term. And then the, the third line, it looks like a dream, as well as an illusion. I was unaware that the body was like non-existence. Um, and also the final line, the illusionary flowers in vision can be unreal or genuine. Flowers and the leaves um, are indeed immaculate. The, these 
lines, they also borrow the Buddhist ideas such as Ru Huan Ru Meng, like an illusion, like a dream, from the Heart Sutra. In addition, um, the term um, Kong Hua or Kong Hua, uh, illusion of flowers, and the term Wu uh, Chen, uh, being immaculate or without dust, they were all these um, Buddhist terms. So I think Liu, he kind of treated the view of um, this rootless orchid as a means of awakening and enlightenment. So that's another additional layer of this orchid Im imagery, um, if we read the, the image and text together. Okay, now we can check the last artist. Dancing pine trees as self-portraits. The loyalist artist and the philosopher Huang Daozhou. Um, this painter, um, we have seen quite a few loyalist artists, and this artist was also loyalist. He was a, a renowned scholar official uh, at the late Ming, and uh, um, he was asked to serve the Qin when, uh, after the collapse of the Ming Dynasty, but he rejected. Because of that uh, rejection, he was killed, so he was a martyr. And uh, um, there was a record which indicates that before he was killed, he, paint, he painted um, pine trees and rocks together on a painting and sent it to, uh, to his friends. So I think the pine trees and rocks there, there are really significant meanings to him. And uh, Huang Daozhou was more actually in scholarship is more known as a calligrapher, but I find her, his painting it was uh, recently um, exhibited in, in Paris, Sanofsky Museum, and I had a chance to observe this whole, a uh, very long hand scroll painting there, and it's basically, I would call it, um, so such ha long hand scroll, it's like a portrait. It's portraits of pine trees, because we can really find the kind of humor, human characters, characteristic um, in the depiction of pine trees. For example, this one uh, on the left, this pine tree is kind of leaning um, between two um, kind of rocks, which suggests it's mountain. This is very unusual. And the other ones, uh, actually, the two, uh, on the, in the lower part, we see the uh, pine trees kind of also in this floating moment. And they are, they, they are not stable. They are not um, growing on the earth and kind of um, um, stably kind of stand up there, and uh, which I will show it in another painting um, here. So this is Guo Xi's early spring, um, a song painting, very famous. And there are two pine trees here. And that's the normal kind of situation of the pine tree painting in China. So it's kind of very, um, gives the sense of stability. And we don't see this kind of leaning and almost dancing kind of the movement of pine trees. And if I trace the Huang Daozhou's own, own poet, poem, uh, which describes the pine trees, he would say, the pine trees, the soft branches grow windward as if they are about to dance. So he really um, did this very odd and eccentric style uh, in his depiction of pine trees. Um, actually, I don't have very concrete um, evidence to show, okay, what kind of voices are the pine trees um, in his depiction. It's a bit hard. Um, I still need more research, but I find the inscription on that painting, which is uh, written by a later um, collector and scholar, he said, the tall pine trees and old rocks together are the self-portraits of Huang Daozhou. So I think there are certain um, meanings there as a loyalist a painter that he painted before he died. I think he was saying something. Or the pine trees or, and the rocks, they, they were trying to say something for the artist. But currently, I still, I think it's mystical and I still need more investigation. But I think the contrast between the, the standard pine tree and this dancing pine trees, the contrast is obvious. So um, 
In the conclusion, the Ming Qing transition caused the trauma and the miserable experiences for individuals. During such times of crisis, plants and landscapes became a pathway for the artist's self-expression as a means of relief and therapy. And I suggest that the representation of plants and nature, they could really stand in and speak for humans and mediate the voices for the human state of mind that was repressed during the trials of the external world. And the hope can be shown and voiced through the little heart surviving under a huge rock on the edge of a mountain by Huang Yunjie, and through the abandoned willows awaiting spring, or actually about to transform winter to spring of peach blossoms in the painting of Gongxian, and through a rootless orchid being strong mended without a home in, the, uh, in Gu Mei and Liu Shi's painting and the poetry. And finally, we could see the hope, perhaps through the dancing kind of happy pine trees that have more flexibility to move on the top of the mountains. I think these images, they, um, they really want to tell us something. Because in the early Qing, somehow it's very difficult if you want to write some, um, some words to show anger, to show your resistance. And these artists, actually, we have evidence that they, many of them, they also escape to mountains to live with nature, just like us. Um, when in the pandemic times, we actually perhaps stay at home more often, and we go to see nature, no humans, and they communicate with the plants. And perhaps, in that sense, they, they paint more about nature rather than human figures. But if you want to ask, what about representation of humans and animals, I also give you some cases, which is um, kind of this one on the left. It's very straightforward. It's by Xiao Yuntong, uh, also a loyalist artist. So he, in this woodblock print, he depicted a, a hung man, which a scholar kind of argued that uh, um, kind of re refers to the death of Chongzhen, the last emperor, because he hung himself uh, uh, in a tree. And the one on the right by Chen Hongshou, he was um, also a loyalist. But he, uh, after the uh, dynastic shift, she escaped to the mountain and became a monk. But he failed to become, become a monk because he could not you know, financially support himself. So he kind of went back to the secular world and uh, selling his paintings Okay, like Huang Yuanjie, uh, also for a while um, by the West Lake to support himself and his family. And he also uh, kind of complained the bad weather, the shortage of food. So, but he was loyal to the Ming. So we, if we look at, uh, in, um, so art historians, they mostly accepted the view that this is a self-portrait of Chen Hongshou, though he didn't put that, okay, this is a self-portrait of me. But if we see his facial expression, we see the deep wrinkles, uh, eyebrow, the eyes. He, he's, he's unhappy. He's definitely unhappy. And he actually um, got drunk. We see this is a, a cup um, on the book. And that is probably the wine jar. So this image really shows his emotional state of being unhappy, being suffered. So that's the human uh, representation about the this period, and also we have figures like that, figures hidden in landscape. That's very interesting. I saw this painting also in the Paris exhibition, and it, <laughs> what's it about? It's actually about filial songs, because if we read the poems on this landscape painting, we call it landscape painting, but we, there are a lot of figures, and the figures are important because this, uh, this painter, Huang Xiangjian, said, OK, basically, I, I, I lost my parents during the chaos. I couldn't find them. So I went so hardly through these mountains, different kinds of mountains, just to search for my parents. And he did find them, well, in, in history. And uh, somehow, people also celebrated his filial uh, status. 
Okay, at the end we also have animals. This is really an angry bird. Art, his, art historians basically they accept this idea. So Ba Da Shan Ren, also the topic of another Kappa's fellow, um, Chen Yi. So Ba Da Shan Ren painted a lot of um, animals, especially birds and fish. And they all have this kind of weird eyes looking up, trying to show, okay, okay, I, I don't care, I don't mind, okay, I, I don't like it. So that kind of language is there. So this is an angry bird for this period. Um, okay, I think I, I can end here after we've seen so many paintings. Um, thank you and welcome your questions and comments. Thank you.